Hello again guys and welcome back to another Big Al Devlin video and this is a continuation of the Nordic Relief System series that I have here on the House of Devlin. Uh, this particular story is called The Mead of Poetry and was promised to you following the last video which was the war between the Aesir and the Veneer. Um, certainly if you're following it in chronological order anyway. If you haven't already seen that video please do watch it and also do watch the cosmology creation myth video also guys because as I say the chronological order of these stories they do follow one another essentially and even though you can kind of sort of dip into your favorite stories a little to some degree it makes it much more complete and full sense when, when you've heard the, the you know each story in succession um because otherwise you'd be like oh who's that and who's that and why are they doing this and, and and everything else okay and so as promised i'm going to give to you the story of the mead of poetry it's quite a brutal story if anything else it's very very lots, lots of murders lots of killing so it is one that's particularly quite entertaining because it's done in quite a lot of jest in some ways also um where we left off at the end of the Icia Veneer War was that basically the Icia and the Veneer they had enough. They had been fighting each other for centuries, if not millennia, and they could see there was going to be no well, there was one of two fates. There was going to be no end to the war, and they'd be fighting for all eternity, or they would wipe each other out. And so um, they ceased the war with the only casualty um, being uh, uh, the Icia named Mimir. Um, whose head was preserved by Odin, who was practiced in the necromantic arts of magic, um, was preserved with herbs and, and various chanting spells and stuff, so that um, whenever Odin ever needed any advice, the, the, the wisdom of Mimir uh, could, could uh, be used. The head would talk and would give it his, his advice to Odin. Um, but other than that, that was the only casualty. Um, but still, one god did die. And the war, however, even though there was only one casualty, it, as I say, it had gone for a long time, and people they, they were just sick of it, and so they decided that that a ceasefire, a truce, this wasn't possible. They they tried it, it didn't work. It ended up in Mimir's death, and so what they needed was a proper alliance, a proper allegiance, and a proper dedication to one another to of, of peace. And so they all spat into a giant vat um, and all the spittle from all the gods from both the Aesir and the Veneer um, came together to form a human being called Kavashir. Okay. Now Kavashir was the wisest human being to ever live and his name literally translates to fermented berry juice. So essentially wine. <laughs> and um, he, he travelled the land um, uh, uh, and there was no no one who, who can ask him a question who he couldn't satisfy with with an answer. He, he had essentially huge amounts of knowledge, and he became very famous uh, and rich. And uh, as he travelled throughout the, the world, giving counsel to whoever needed it most. Now Kavashir was invited to to the home of two dwarfs. This is where our story begins. So we've that's the end of the war now. Now this is the mead of poetry story. And he was invited to the home of two dwarfs called the Deceiver and Screamer, or Fiala and Gala, as their original names are. Upon his arrival, the dwarf slew Kavashir and brewed mead with his blood. This mead contained Kavashir's ability to dispense wisdom and was appropriately named Stirrer of Inspiration. And who drank of it would become a poet or scholar instantly overnight. Okay. When the gods questioned them about Kavashi's appearance, um, uh, Deceiver and Screamer told them that Kavashi had choked on his own wisdom. I love that answer. It's so full of contempt. How anyone would not suspect something with that response, I don't know. But it was enough to throw the gods off. Okay. 
The two dwarfs apparently delighted in the murder and the fact that they got away with it, and so continued their murder spree. And soon after the incident of killing Gavashia, they took out uh, the giant called Gilling out to sea and drowned him for sport. The sound of Gilling's wife, however, weeping all, all the time, irritated them, so they killed her as well. This time by dropping a millstone on her head as she passed under the doorway of their house. However, the last of mischief that they performed, um, they weren't not to get away with, as Jinning's son, so Jinning was the one who was drowned, um, Sutung, this means heavy with drink, learned of his father's murder and seized the dwarfs and at low tide carried them out to the reef that would soon be overflowed with waves. The dwarfs pleaded to the giant with their lives, and Sutung granted their requests only when they agreed to give him um, uh, the mead that they had brewed with Kavashia's blood. Satung hid the vats of mead in a chamber beneath the mountain, the mountain called Pulsing Rock, where he appointed his daughter Gunlod to watch over them. Now Odin, chief of gods, who is always after wisdom, and his restless is unstoppable in his pursuit of wisdom, was displeased with the precious meads being hoarded away selflessly beneath a mountain. He bent his will towards acquiring it for himself and for those who he deemed worthy of its powers. And so he travels the cosmos disguised as a wandering farmhand. Odin went to the farm of Satung's brother, Balgi. There he found nine servants mowing hay. He approached each of them, took out a whetstone from underneath his cloak, and offered to them to sharpen their scythes. They eagerly agreed, and afterwards marvelled at how well their scythes cut the hay. They all each declared how that this must be the finest whetstone to have ever uh, be, uh, existed, and each asked to purchase it from Odin. Odin consented to sell it, but he did warn them, you must pay a high Price. He then, as he said this, threw the stone into the air, and in their scramble to catch it, the nine uh, servants killed each other with their scythes. Odin then went to Balgi's door and introduced himself as um, the worker of misfortune, <laughs> Bolveka, I believe it's pronounced, but in English translates into worker of misfortune. He offered to do the work of the nine servants, who he said, had basically killed each other in a dispute in the field earlier that day. But as his reward, he demanded, a, uh, for doing the work of the nine workers, he demanded a sip of Satung's mead. Balki responded that he had no control over the mead that Satung guarded, but that if he could truly perform the work of nine men, he would help, if this, this, uh, help him to obtain his desires. Okay. At the end of the growing season, Odin had more than fulfilled the work of nine men and, and fulfilled his promise to the giant, who as a result agreed to accompany him to Satung to inquire about the mead. Satung, however, angrily refused. The disguised god, that is Odin, okay, um, reminded Balgi of their bargain, convinced the giant uh, and convinced the giant uh, to aid him into gaining access into Gunlod's dwelling. Okay, so it was obvious to Odin that Satung was not going to give him the need, so he had to take it. And so he thought, if I can get into Gunlod's dwelling, Gunlod is, is, is Satung's daughter, the one guarding the need, he might be able to do something about it and take the need. Okay? Um, and so the two went together uh, to part of the mountain where Balki knew uh, that. Uh, 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 was next to um, Gunnod's dwelling. Okay, Odin took out what's something called an auger from his cloak and handed it to Borgi and told him to drill at the rock. The giant did so and after much work announced that the hole was finished. However, Odin was not convinced and blew into the hole to verify Balgi's claim. And when the rock drift, uh, dust blew back into his face, he knew that his companion had in fact lied to him. The suspicious god then bade the giant to finish what he had started. Then Balgi proclaimed the hole to be complete for a second time, 
Odin once again blew into the tar- into the hole, and this time the debris was blown through the hole, and the hole was complete. Odin thanked Borgi for his help, and shifted his shape into that of a snake, and he crawled through the hole. But as he did so, Borgi stabbed at him with the auger, but Odin made it through just in time, the auger missing him. So Borgi, even though he helped, obviously had a problem with Odin. <laughs> now once inside, he assumed the form of a char- charming young man who made his way where Gunnlod guarded the mead. He won a favour and secured her a promise for, uh, from her a promise that if he would sleep for her for three nights, she would grant him three sips from, uh, 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 of, of the mead. After the third night, Odin went to the mead, which was stored in three vats, and he consumed the contents of each vat in a single draught. He kept his word, only one sip from each vat, but <laughs> he emptied them. Regardless, Odin obviously knew that um, John Lod would not be happy with, with this, and so instantly he changed shape into that of an eagle and flew off towards Asgard, the celestial stronghold, with the prize still within his throat. Satung soon discovered the trickery and took on the form of another eagle and flew after in, the, in pursuit of Odin. Now the giants were particularly good shapeshifters, they had an affinity for it, their magic was very good at uh, changing shape, so the eagle that the giant formed would have been faster, more likely, and more powerful than Odin, so Odin really, you know, had to, you know, put, you know, really go for it, so to speak, he was in potentially quite a bit of trouble here. Now when the gods in Asgard spied the leader approaching them, with the tongue close behind, they set out several vessels at the rim of their fortress. Odin reached the abode of his fellow gods just before Satung could catch him, and the giant retreated in anguish. As Odin came to, towards the uh, the vessels, he regurgitated the mead into them, and as he did so, um, however, he a few drops fell from his beak, down from, down from Asgard and into Midgard, the world of humankind below. These drops are the source of the abilities of all the bad and mediocre poets of, uh, and scholars of the world. But the true poets and scholars, and those with skill, are said to be those whom Odin dispenses his mead personally and with care. And so the, the, the story is over. But basically this story is quite an interesting one because it gives a different viewpoint um, to where knowledge can come from. Obviously, in the modern world, we we see knowledge as being a product of logic. We have a a thought, um, and that can then lead to, and that force is our own, um, um, and that thought is our own, as I said. And we call this process of developing a thought reason. And it all comes, or normally starts with, an assumption. Okay? Um, And without going into too many details, I mean, we all know what assumptions are, thoughts are, and all the rest of it. And if we were to come up with any original thought whatsoever, i.e. we were to write a song, or or, or to create a play, or anything like that, we'd give ourselves, more likely or not, the credit for it. We would not, not think that there's some outside force influencing us, or giving us inspiration, so to speak. However, in the older world, um, it was believed that, yes, you, you probably could come up with stuff for yourself, that, you know, um, maybe, but original thought was always... A, believed as being inspired by the gods um, and um, the way to get close to the gods was to drink to enter what was described as an ecstatic trance and there were um, not just within Viking culture there was it, it was in Greek culture as well there were um, ceremonies or, or practices that were done regularly that allowed um, scholars um, the philosophers of ancient Greece, for example, um, but also the scholars of, 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 of the Nordic people and poets and, and, and all this to to basically all sit in a house, 
lock, lock the doors, get drunk all night and come up with whatever ideas they could come up with. And the uh, the ancient, I don't know what the name of the ancient Greek uh, practice was done uh, was called, but I know it was done very regularly. Uh, Aristotle was involved many a time, I know that. Um, but um, the ancient pre-Christian Germanic peoples called the process symbol in Old Norse or symbol in Old English. I e. it's the root word of symbol. Okay, so that's where the word symbol comes from. And it's a practice where, um, basically, like I just mentioned, you essentially lock yourself in, in a house or some form of dwelling and drink alcohol um, as a group um, until you enter a state of ecstasy, as they described it in ancient times. Um, and it was held, and very, very, very readily believed that um, this was... Uh, this was the most inspired state because it's one it's no, it was known that it was very hard to say nothing but the truth whilst drunk it's very hard to lie when drunk and so they believed that whatever came out of their mouth at, at this point would be pure honesty for starters and would be potentially if it was uh, uh, of any sort of value would be are inspired by the gods, especially when mead was used, because mead was, of course, um, the drink that that linked um, hum, uh, man, man, mankind with with, uh, with the gods. Essentially, they saw the process of getting drunk as removing the cold, dispassionate mindset that uh, you can develop by being within just a normal world and that alcohol would just bring you closer to the, 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 the gods by opening you up and, and, and uh, removing that dispassionate self that, that, that humans can hold at times. Um, in contrast to that, in modern times, I mean, there, there are a lot of rock stars and stuff, especially in the 60s and 70s, who use drugs and alcohol and stuff like that to write some of their very best songs. So maybe there's something to be said behind this. But um, obviously, these days, we believe that our thoughts and our assumptions and things like that are personally our own and are rationalistic in, 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 in essence. Um, and and uh, of a subjective or objective na nature by in by by you know default but there would be in ancient times room for a third aspect so i mean you know the ancient people were aware that you could have your own thoughts but they believed that you could have what was inspired thoughts also um and so you've got objective subjective and inspired but in modern culture, you have objective and subjective. So you see how thought processes and the the, the, the luck of or the belief of how, where thoughts come from have changed over time. Uh, whether that's right or not, I mean, I'd like to. I mean, I, I don't actually believe in this part myself. Um, I believe that our thoughts are our own, but. Um, um, but with a lot of the music, as I say, that the, a lot of the music that I particularly like, uh, most of it was written when the, uh, the good stuff was written when when the people were drunk. So maybe there's something to be said said about it when the when the songwriters were drunk. It, maybe there's something to be said about it. Maybe there is some form of inspiration, divine inspiration, and and vibing. Uh, is one way of getting closer to the gods and allowing that inspiration, make it, making it easier for that inspiration to, 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 to come to you, maybe. Or maybe it's just alcohol and that influence the mind in such a way that makes it more creative. I do go down the line of biology in this route, but it's it was their way um, of, um, in ancient times, obviously, of how... Um, you could just suddenly just create this fantastic idea out of nowhere um, uh, and and how alcohol and that influenced the mind. They didn't know that when you drank, they knew you got drunk, but they didn't know the process that if you drink, what happens is alcohol toxicity and the blood goes up and all the rest of it. They didn't know all that. They just knew if they got drunk, you'd get happy to start with it, and after that you'd get really, you know, sozzled. 
I mean, your sozzle, you can come out with some really, you know, random stuff, and sometimes that stuff is good, but half the time, to be honest, half the time, after working as a doorman, half the time, <laughs> most of the stuff you come out with is, is garbage, but nonetheless, um, it did affect their viewpoint, and they were, the ancient people as a whole, not just the Vikings, let's say ancient Greeks at the very least, I know, had, had this um, belief set, and had an actual you know, cultural thing that you do every Friday, you, you just lock yourself in a house and get drunk, they do it regularly, um, and we've had uh, Sumble, um, the, 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 um, the Viking version of it, you know, there, there were obviously ceremonies dedicated to this, and so people were aware that you could, if you uh, maybe had a writer's block, uh, uh, remove it by attending a Sumble, you know, uh, if nothing else, you're going to have a good night. <laughs> so there's nothing wrong in it. At the very least, you're going to have a good night. But if not, you're going to share um, innovative, potentially innovative and new thoughts. That that was the idea behind it for the scholars, that when you drink, you, you, you open your mind to new ideas. You're, you're less set in stone, so to speak, to your current mindset. And so there is something to be said about it. Um... But I still do believe that you've got subjective and objective thoughts, and they do come from ourselves. Uh, alcohol just makes it sometimes a little bit easier to, to you know, to, to see um, uh, uh, beyond the obvious. Um, but maybe, just maybe, that is the inspired thoughts, which of course the ancients did believe in.